Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 33. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. God said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name of the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on a rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. When I was growing up, my mother was my campfire girl leader. Wohi Lo. There were 14 girls in our troop, and every Wednesday we proudly donned our navy blue skirts and our white camp shirts and our blue felt berets, and we wore them to school. The fancy girls would wear a sash across their chest, declaring their accomplishments, but they were cumbersome and they'd get in the way at recess, so most of us saved those for the meeting after school. On Thursdays, the Cub Scouts wore their uniform, and on Fridays, the Future Farmers of America wore their green hats and, again, a sash. This was a way of publicly declaring that we belonged to a pack, a club, or a tribe. It also advertised a uniformity of values, an aspirational intent to be good people in the world. We knew, as others did, that we were not alone in pursuing collective goodness, and that made a difference. I'm really certain that those 13 years that I spent as a campfire girl were foundational in developing who I am today. I learned my own self-worth, but I also became aware of the intrinsic worth of all people the importance of compassion and service to others. Perhaps you grew up in a youth group or a drama troupe or a sports team and you too can remember what it felt like to be included in the embrace of that circle, to be known and named, to belong. Then we grew up and started careers and families of our own, and most of us moved away from belonging to the groups of our youth. Some of us joined churches, some of us special interest groups throughout the various decades of our lives, maybe sororities or fraternities in college, but 
We didn't wear our uniforms to school anymore. And it became increasingly difficult to know who belonged where. So how do we recognize others who hold values similar to ours now? How do we see ourselves meaningfully mirrored back to us? I think that's what politics have become in our country. I think the polarization we watched play out in our nation this past week echoes a crisis of belonging, a lack of faith in believing that it is possible to work with others toward a common goal. What happened on election night, what's been happening these past four years in our country is about people trying to get a foothold in that place of belonging. After all, political campaigns have uniforms that help us identify who's in which group. And because we want so badly to be part of something meaningful, we buy the shirt. We wear the hat or slap the bumper sticker on the back of our car in the hopes that others might recognize us and reach out, or at the very least, that those with whom we disagree will keep their distance. But therein lies the problem, beloved. Unlike the Cub Scouts or 4-H, political uniforms do not invite a movement toward a collective good. Our uniforms draw lines in the sand that have become virtually impenetrable. They make us forget our common humanity. They pit us against each other and offer a false sense of security. I wonder if these clubs of the Republic have done more harm than good. In today's text, we overhear God in conversation with Moses, and it is really a conversation worth tuning into because it is all about belonging. Belonging to something bigger than ourselves, bigger than a club or a political party, this passage outlines what it means to belong to God. The conversation between God and Moses is about perseverance. It is about summoning up courage in the face of adversity. It is about overcoming pain and acting one shade braver than we feel we might be able to act. This passage is about the humility of knowing that God is God. And what we see and understand of God is but a sliver of the whole picture. God is God. Democracy is not God. Capitalism is not God. It is God to whom we belong more than any club, more than any political party. It is to God that we are known by name, no matter who is elected to the highest office of this land. The most important message we can take from today's passage is that Moses chooses, with God's love, to keep going forward. After this little pep talk, and a glimpse of the divine, Moses is willing to begin striving again to reach the promised land, even though he knows it will not be revealed to him in his lifetime. And listen, he does this not for himself alone, but for future generations of the faithful. 
Rest assured, beloved, that no matter who ultimately wins this presidential election, what we are doing with our energies and our efforts is not for us alone, but to pave a way forward for future generations. When people join our little church, our beautiful little sacred community, I always ask them, why church? Why now? During this election and stewardship season, I think that's an important question for all of us to ask. Why church? Why now? I believe we have chosen this church at this moment in time because we know we belong here. I certainly hope you feel welcomed, supported, challenged, prayed for, and upheld because you are, each and every one of you. You are so deeply loved that you will be challenged to become your very best self. And that is a gift beyond price. I've been listening over and over to the Keep Going On song that was posted last week. We belong to this church because it keeps us going on. On days when I despair, you raise me up. On days when you despair, I raise you up. We do that for each other so that we can keep going, keep going, keep going on. In this church, we reassure one another that the values we share through our common relationship with Jesus are worthy of risk. They are worthy of trying and failing and trying and failing and trying again because after all, it's not about how many times we fall down. It's about how many times we help somebody else up. When Amy Sims spoke in our worship gathering last Sunday, I wished I'd had the foresight to record her. She spoke about what it means to Oliver and Kayla, her beautiful children, to have a very dear and special Godly Play community. They look forward to it every week. They know that they are safe, that they are known, that they are beloved, and that they will be heard and held and prayed for in that circle. Amy talked about how much it means to her that the sacred stories of our tradition are being handed down to her children so carefully, so intentionally, through our church and through Katie Morrison. This is promised land thinking, you see. This is future looking that's beyond our own need for survival. Amy's thinking about her children and their children and their children's children. She's thinking about nurturing the next generation's faith in God and trust in the power of community. We need that more than ever. This is why this church matters now. This is why it will matter tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. I called Vida in the hospital last Sunday after we ended our Zoom call to see if there was anything she wanted to communicate to the church about our budget as we went into our budget planning meeting. She said, oh yes. Tell the church that Kathy and I are excited to give to the hope chest because it promises that there will be a tomorrow. Tell the church that even those who don't Zoom with us each week know that they belong to us. She said, this will all be over one day. And when it is, we'll all be able to get together again in person. But tell everyone that until then, we're keeping the lights on as a sign of a better tomorrow. Generously as you 
as you are able to support the ministries and mission of First Congregational Church Sonoma in the year 2021 so that we can continue to keep the lights on 